the 12th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I remind everyone in the public gallery to switch any electrical devices to silent so as not to interfere with proceedings. We have apologies today from committee members Kezia Dugdale, Jamie Halko Johnson and Dean Lockhart and may also welcome Tom Mason as a substitute for uh, Dean Lockhart and item one on the agenda is to invite Mr. Mason to declare any relevant interests. Uh, yes, I, I still remain a uh, member of council in Aberdeen City and my small consultancy deals with China extensively. And are there any other declarations of interest from other committee members? Yes, convener, um, it won't have escaped your attention that, like Paul Sheeran, I'm a director of Strathleaf and Regeneration Company, but I'm sure that isn't going to make me any kinder to him. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And item two on the agenda is a decision for the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we turn today to our inquiry in Scotland's economic performance and I'd like to welcome our witnesses today and in no particular order we have Paul Sheeran just mentioned uh, Chief Executive Officer of Scottish Engineering, Karen Betts Chief Executive Officer of the Scotch Whiskey Association, Neil Francis Interim Managing Director Scottish Development International, uh, James Brody Director of Scotland and China Business Advisor of the China Britain Business Council and last but not least, Claire Slipper, Political Affairs Manager at NFU Scotland. So welcome to all of you today. Thank you for coming in. Um, if I might start with um, a fairly general question, and this is about Scotland's competitiveness in the international market. Where is Scotland the most competitive and where the least competitive in international terms? Um, and I should say the... Sound desk will operate your microphones. Obviously, it's not necessary to come and respond to every question from each of you. Uh, we'll try and let the it flow as a, a bit of a discussion. Uh, if there are, are other things you'd like to add to your evidence, then you can write into the committee if there's something that you aren't able to respond to today or want to add a bit of detail to. So, who would like to start with that opening question? Any volunteers? Yeah. Paul um, so uh, I, I think from an engineering manufacturing point of view, um, I do see uh, evidence that we are uh, competitive um, in terms of uh, you know manufacturing worldwide. I, I've seen evidence recently of, of companies that are um, manufacturing for uh, the aerospace and, uh, and space industries, um, where they are winning bu business in Italy. Um, and they're doing so because they are being innovative, they, because they've invested time, effort and energy in lean practices, in the way they manufacture, uh, and they're seeing the result of that. I think uh, the, the challenge for that is, is that those companies that are doing that and are successful are by no means unique. They are mostly on the same path as the other companies around Scotland. Um, the challenge be becomes the one to open the door or open the mindset to uh, to really um, target export um, uh, as, a, as a really su as a successful way of increasing their business. And I think you, you mentioned Italy there. Um, post leaving the EU, are there changes in emphasis that should be developed by Scottish companies in terms of where they seek markets internationally or does nothing change as a result of that? Would you have a view on that? So um, we are maybe two minutes in and we get to the B word. Um, the real challenge I think there, so across uh, uh, Scottish engineering and manufacturing companies is the famous lack of clarity. Um, companies are so I, I would say engineering and manufacturing companies, we are by nature, engineers are pragmatic. Um, in some ways, we almost like a problem. That's kind of what we're in it for. We set ourselves to say, okay, that's tough. How are we gonna fix that? The problem is, is first of all, you need to know what the problem is. So the challenge for all those companies out there is they're saying, look, and I haven't met one yet that has anything nice to say about the prospect of Brexit, but 
they also say, look, once we know what it is, we'll roll our sleeves up and get on with it. The problem is, is we don't know what it is. And, you know, right now, those that are watching and following closely are saying, you know, there may be some snippets of, of supposed clarity, but nothing agreed is, and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Um, and we all know there are some big questions which hold out that final everything being agreed. So I think that's the real, the real challenge. So those companies who are expanding into export, and particularly Italy and Europe, are saying, what's this going to look like later? And, but right now, what they can't say is, is, if I do A, B, and C, I'll be able to you know, take account of that and work around it, because I don't know what I'm facing. Right. Anyone else like to come in on the question about where Scotland is strong or weak in international terms? Um, Karen Betts. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, in, in very bold terms, obviously, Scotch whisky can only be produced in Scotland, so it's not as if we're competing. Uh, it's not as if uh, Scotch could be uh, produced anywhere else at a, uh, you know, at cheaper rates or whatever. So it's a slightly different question for us. But I think when you, you know, when you look at markets around the world and when you look back at Scotland from, from being overseas, uh, I would say that we still, as a country, have a reputation for quality, integrity and innovation in what we produce. And, uh, and certainly in my previous role in the UK Foreign Office, I think that was, uh, was very clear. Then in terms, of, uh, in terms of being competitive overseas, I mean, looked at from an industry like Scotch whisky, um, there's an enormous amount that, that any of us have to do to, to get out there internationally, to know our markets and to know our consumers. And that's, you know, that's about, there's some very basic questions there around how competitive you are against whatever your global competition is when you export uh, outside Scotland, outside the UK. Now, we compete against other spirits, um, categories of spirits, we, we compete against other whiskies, and those questions become very relevant for our companies as they look at how Scotch's market share matches up against other spirits' market share, where our competition is, where we need to appeal to consumers. I think as we look at Brexit and all of the, the challenges, that uh, the, the changes to the way in which we uh, export and trade overseas, all, all the changes that are going to happen as we go through Brexit and come out the other side, uh, the, 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 the issue I would float really is around how you bring together trade policy and trade prom promotion to, uh, to better uh, support Scottish exports uh, in overseas markets. Right, thank you. I think we'll come on to a question from John Mason now, which may develop the, some of the themes in that. Uh, John Mason. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, I was interested, Mr Sheeran used the word mindset in there, and um, I mean, it's been suggested to us that Scottish firms or Scottish individuals are just not ambitious enough. They, they just don't have their horizons kind of high enough. Is, is that something you recognise? Is that something uh, we need to deal with? And if so, how do we deal with it? Do we teach ambition to primary kids in school, or how do you do that? So, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't feel that <coughs> it's a lack of ambition, um, because you know those those companies who are are not export based feel to me to be ambitious for their businesses, um, and that that comes back to so in terms of mindset, I don't think it's ambition. It's um, it's more about um, someone having opened the door or, or showing them what that could look like. Um, so companies who do well at that, who previously didn't, it comes from, or I see evidence of it coming from where you get new staff come in, who've come in from a, maybe a bigger company who have been working internationally. And so they, they come in and say, do you know what? This exporting thing is not that, not that difficult. Um, and there are companies out there that uh, around the world who want our products and services. Um, we just need to do a bit of work to get ourselves in that in that marketplace. So something brings it. So it can be you know a cross pollination that comes from people who've been in other businesses. But I think you're right. I think the enterprise and education is absolutely key. Uh, you know we we have to to we have to uh, educate a, a generation who don't think of the borders being Scotland, the UK, or Europe, but but genuinely worldwide. 
just add to that. <coughs> I would agree uh, with Paul. I think uh, our best companies are as ambitious as any other companies I come across internationally. I think the, the challenge is we probably do not have enough businesses that have that scale of ambition. I think I'm right in saying that if you look at the whole kind of company base in Scotland, uh, we've got about 17,000 companies that employ more than uh, 10 employees and uh, are growing at a rate of 10% over any three-year period. So I think there's something also around uh, the structural kind of uh, of our economy, the amount of businesses we have that have a strong platform in their domestic market that then allows them to uh, take on uh, the things Paul were talking about, about the awareness and uh, you need a bit more extra resource and capacity to go internationally because it takes a bit longer to do. So it's really important that you have a strong uh, foundation in your domestic market. Uh, I do think uh, there's more to do, especially around the awareness. I think uh, to get more of our businesses to understand the uh, opportunities there are by trading internationally and how to manage and mitigate the risks associated with doing that. And Claire Slipper. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm here representing NFU Scotland, which is um, a membership organisation made up of 8,500 farming businesses, and we have crofters and growers and professional businesses in there as well. Um, and at NFU Scotland, we like to make a big play of the fact that we are essentially the, the foundation stone of the food and drinks industry, which, going back to the first question about competitiveness, has shown a massive expansion, particularly in the last 10 years, um, with exports totalling about 5 billion, I believe, um, and ambitions to go that much further. So to move on to the second question about ambition, um, we recently signed up to the launch of a new document called Ambition 2030, which we think is a fantastic um, piece of work. And I'm sure that if you've had representatives from the food and drink industry giving evidence to the committee, you'll have heard about um, some, of the, some of the measures within that document. Um, so, so there is there is ambition. However, for our members representing the, the primary production end of it, um, we are still seeing major issues with competitiveness. Um, agricultural businesses are subject to a range of different change drivers, not least things like the geography and the weather, but also um, unfairness within supply chains, price volatility, cash flow problems, uh, capital management, etc. So. Um, Going back to the B word, um, th there's a lot of uncertainty abound, and I think that at the current time, a, a lot of folk are uh, perhaps um, lo looking a bit less less ambitious about um, looking ahead to the future and, and and where things might be because it's a bit of a batten down the hatches at the current time um, in light of the political situation that we find ourselves in. Can I ask, would your members be thinking directly of exporting? I mean, say it's a beef farmer. Mm -hmm. Or are they thinking, no, I'm going to sell my beef to X and then X might do the exporting? So it wouldn't mm -hmm. really be on their agenda so much, the exporting side and things? Um, we have long supply chains in Scotland. Um, so, but our, our members are, I mean, they're very, they are very concerned that, about the potential for export to be displaced. Um, but it, it, it differs between commodities. So we have to be very careful about talking about um, it, you know, a big boom in exporting internationally agricultural products more generally, because some sectors will prefer, will prefer a more protectionist approach. Um, however, in light of the political situation, I think we have to be looking at sort of new and innovative ideas and putting people directly in touch with new markets abroad, um, because our provenance, um, as Karen outlined in her opening remarks, is absolutely our USP, and that's what we'll, we will be selling on in, in, into the future. Um, James Brody. Thank you, Camina. Um, yeah, just to come in on the second question around ambition, I think anecdotally the companies that I, I meet that uh, seek me out to um, for advice on doing business with China are hugely ambitious um, in, in general terms. Um, I can't speak to the, the, the broader spectrum of, of, of Scottish industry and businesses and perhaps the statistics. Um, so do you have to be more ambitious to sell to China than, say, to sell to the Netherlands? Not necessarily. I think um, it's difficult to, to say exactly uh, which 
countries. More, I think there are pr probably greater differences in exporting to China than there would be in exporting a product to uh, to the Netherlands. Um, certainly in the current context of being part of the European Union and the customs um, market. So I think you would need to certainly address certain differences. Um, there may it very much depends on the product or service that you're selling, but there may be further barriers to overcome um, if you were looking to export to China. Um, but when they, those businesses do come to me, they're clearly um, articulating great ambition for, for their own um, business. In terms of how we can um, increase that ambition on a, on a broader scale, then I think we do need to uh, point to success stories um, to engage with um, you know pupils at school at the very earliest stage to open their eyes to the opportunities um, whilst also highlighting the some of the challenges but just make build that awareness um, of both the opportunity and the challenge so that we're we're be better equipped to take on that that challenge of exporting um, in the future um, and that's certainly you know something that that um, we're committed to to doing ourselves at the China Britain Business Council. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Thank you. Um, I mean, our our member companies range from from listed PLCs through to small businesses, and they all export uh, very successfully and usually from a very early stage in their development. So many younger companies will set themselves up, will establish their UK market, and then will get exporting very quickly. Now, one of the things that so are that people kind of more ambitious from that point of view in whiskey because whiskey is such an international product per se so it's does that make it easier in in your sector well i think it makes it a much more obvious thing to do i mean uh, most of our companies know that there are very strong international market for whiskey uh, for whiskey out there and you know they either know because they've been exporting for a number of years or they know because they see other companies do it and you know to a degree over the 150 odd years that our industry has been exporting, the road is gradually more and more paved into the 180 odd markets into which we export. And our industry is very collaborative in that way. And you know, many of our smaller companies will readily acknowledge that you know, their, their road to exporting in China has been paved by the bigger companies. And a trade association like ours works very hard to tackle trade barriers one way or the other whether those are through trade agreements or whether those are through lobbying in countries in hand in hand with with government to tackle tariff barriers or behind the border barriers and any of the complications that people might uh, might encounter as they actually practically get into exporting the ambition question is is asked of us a bit because we are you know we're clearly good at exporting and uh, a couple of years ago we set up with Scotland food and drink and export collaboration Charter, which was designed to uh, to help raise the issues, I suppose, around exporting, help people understand the sorts of things they would need to understand in order to export successfully. And we've done we've done a number of uh, of exercises through that. Uh, what I would say is the take up hasn't been massive. So you know, I come back to that question around well, you know, what is it? Because I think there is actually quite a lot of resource out there. Uh, if you are thinking about exporting, you know, we offer help with Scotland Food and Drink, SDI does, the Chambers of Commerce do. There's quite a lot out there if you go and look for it, but perhaps something else is, is holding people back, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what that is. I do think, personally, that language in education is very important. I think educating our young people to have an international outlook at school and to be comfortable operating in in foreign languages will remain very important economically as we move forward thanks so much <coughs> thank you and now andy whiteman uh, thanks very much convener um paul i think you mentioned um the space industry um in your opening remarks i'm just wondering if uh, members can give the, uh, the the committee other examples of particular success stories um within scottish business where they've um been exporting uh, very successfully or started exporting or have attracted inward investment or indeed are investing overseas. Um, I mean, the whiskey is an obvious one. You've been doing it for a long, long time. Um, so we kind of know about that one. I'm just wondering if there are other kind of particular success stories and, and what lessons we might learn from them. I think uh, a, a good 
good is a food and drink one again, but I think it brings together a lot of things that you have to do to be successful in the international market. Uh, you'll recall, I think, last year, uh, haggis was exported again for the, f or, or for the first time, or, or again, uh, to the Canadian uh, market. Now, that was as a result of a lot of influence uh, at a government and regulatory level to make the case of uh, the safety issues uh, that the Canadian government were concerned of in terms of taking that product. Uh, that was done over a number of years and reached a very successful outcome, I think it was in 2014. But that then kind of opened the door, but then uh, we've worked with other partners, with companies like McSween's on reformulating their product. So you can't just take the haggis that's sold in Scotland and sell it straight into the Canadian market. There's still uh, uh, particular regulations and standards you have to meet. So there's, there's all that reformulation in terms of the product. We have an in-market, uh, or SDI has, with Scotland Food and Drink, has an in-market specialist in the Canadian market who was working uh, the networks and the potential customers uh, during this process. And then that's led successfully to McSween trading uh, very well in the Canadian market. James Brody wanted to come in. Yes, um, we ran our first ever China Scotland Business Awards this uh, January. And uh, certainly I could point to, and I can send the committee um, on the details of the shortlisted companies, which it's about a, a dozen um, companies, all with great, um, some of them exporting, some of them investment stories, um, and, and right across the, the board in terms of um, economic sector, ranging from uh, peak scientific instruments um, who um, manufacture uh, gas generators um, and have had a very successful um, and fast-growing business in, in China for the last four years. They, they won Exporter of the Year through to... Um, the aviation sector, Finlay Irvin, um, local SME to, to Pennycook, um, manufacturing machines that measure the grippiness of runways. Very important when you're landing an aircraft, apparently. Um, and uh, right through to some of the larger PLCs like uh, Babcock International and some of the design work that they've been doing for shipyards in China for state-of-the-art LNG vessels. Um, so there's... The, 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 there are a lot of great success stories to, to, to point to um, in, in really quite a range of, of different areas. Um, I think it's just about shouting louder about them and, and um, engaging with them uh, and bringing them together with other companies who are on that journey um, to, to learn from, from their experience. And Paul Sheeran. I'd like to add just a couple of points uh, on that. So my initial example was... Uh, about finding export to the space industry in Italy. Um, the committee may know I'm relatively new to this post, about a month and a half into this role. Uh, prior to that, though, you know, I am an engineer and reasonably well networked in the engineering uh, um, world in Scotland. Um, I have been surprised the number of metal fabricators that I have gone into in the last month and a half who are making aerospace and space parts. It's not the headline part of their business. Um, and some of the the products they're making are truly innovative and they're winning the business because of that. Um, and I didn't know about it, so it's well hidden, um, but it has shown to me that there is uh, a, another cross-pollination. So wherever I go to other metal fabricators, you know, the, one of the, the issues I'm raising with them is, have you considered this sector? You know, there is, there's a marketplace out there and Scottish companies are being competitive. That's the first one to tack on. The other one I wanted to add was I did want to echo something that Karen said about languages. Um, and so we talked already about where does it come from? Is it a lack of ambition? And I, I argued that really it was about opening um, a kind of mindset towards this is a possibility. I think languages in school is massively important to that. Um, and I think it, what's important about it is that it's not the language you learn, it's a language. Um, because if you look at the challenge of internationalization, um, we're rarely going to be in a situation where we're conversing with our, our, our 
customers or suppliers in their own language. But at least if someone has learned the basics of, of, uh, of a foreign language, then they understand that language is constructed differently, that the person sitting across from them is not speaking in their first language, and have some patience, you know, and slow down. Um, and that comes from having a basic grasp. Um, so, you know, I think this is, is really key. It has to be whether it, you know, not everyone is going to go on to be, you know, sort of foreign language uh, students for their education. But, but foreign language is really important if Scotland wants to have um, ambition for interna internationalisation. Thank you. And Claire Slipper. Yeah, it's just a, just a small point about um, international exports. And um, we have a really good example within Scotland's sea potato industry, um, it's an unsupported sector within Scottish agriculture. Um, and it's a little known fact, but we grow 70% of the UK's sea potatoes um, and export 73% of them to countries like Egypt and Morocco. Um, which isn't really shouted about, but clearly that's going to be an issue moving forward with um, new trade deals. We need to try and secure preferential access, otherwise these quite quite large capacity within Scotland, although it's a small sector, um, will be displaced almost overnight. So we need to think, start thinking about things like export certification and having all of the infrastructure there already in order to have a seamless transition. So in terms of some of these success stories, what, what, what are the key lessons to be learned for other, from other companies who are perhaps not seen as ambitious enough or not realising what the opportunities are? I mean, is there a case for, I mean, James Brewer, you talked about um, the China Awards um, earlier this year. I mean, is, is there a, a case for much, much more peer support within the industry, with, across industries and within sectors like food and drink to encourage more exporting? I think peer-to-peer uh, -peer support is is has proven to be very uh, successful. I think both uh, companies who who are on the receiving end uh, respond very positively to uh, support from people who've been there, done it. So I think uh, clearly uh, it's it's something that we need to carry on nurturing and and helping happen. And as Karen said. There's good examples of it happening across sectors uh, uh, currently. I think, you know, Paul made, made the point about it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So I think when you look at international, it might be from within companies from within the same sector, but it could also be from companies from different sectors, but who have an experience in a particular market that the uh, company is targeting. So I think it can be, you know, both sector specific, but also market specific. And I think that is a very powerful way of supporting uh, the ambition and the capability for companies to trade internationally. The other thing I thought you were going to say, Andy, was <coughs> I think we do have a bit of an issue uh, in Scotland of celebrating success. And I think that I thought that was the point you're going to make in terms of of the uh, awards that, well, you've made that it. Uh, uh, James uh, was going to say. Uh, I do think we need to do more about publicly celebrating those companies that are doing a fantastic job trading internationally. There's more for us to do there. We've got the Scottish Exports Awards that I think are in their fourth or fifth year. Uh, I was at uh, the award ceremony this year. Over 500 uh, people attending the award, so that's grown uh, uh, rapidly over, over that period. And a very broad range of companies receiving the awards. Bridge of Wheel Lever got the overall exporter of the year, so that's obviously from a textile point of view. You had SST Sensing, which is a, basically a an engineering uh, company. You had Turtle, the people who produce the uh, alternative to those wrap-round uh, travel pillows. Uh, you know, you know uh, and you had a company, uh, Pure Malt Products, that have taken a very what used to be a very kind of uh, commodity-based product and turned it into something that's much more valuable. So a real broad range, and I think the more we can do to celebrate the success of those companies doing a great job, the better. Um, yeah. 
I think Karen Betts has to leave at this point, so thank you for coming in. And I've, I've probably got another <laughs> ten minutes or so. Have you, have you <laughs> rescheduled? All right. I was going to just uh, intervene on that point and say that I do think that in-market support, where it's possible, is important. And I think that's around helping new exporters understand the issues in the market that they are trying to export so, so into. When you, when you say in-market support, what precisely do you mean? Well, I mean government support where it's available. And, okay. uh, and I think that there, you know, there's a good deal that, that government can do. Uh, and there are a number of Scottish government uh, uh, officials based around the world, and some of them are teamed up with the Department of International Trade officials around the world and where those teams can help exporters understand the particular issues in that, those markets, that's really useful information. It's information that they don't then have to find for themselves as a sort of, you know, accelerating, uh, accelerating an in-market knowledge issue that I think is helpful and that can be really helpful on the trade promotion side. But on the trade policy side, it's really important too, and it will become increasingly important as we go through Brexit and come out the other side. Because at the moment, for most trade policy issues in markets, we use the European Commission to, uh, to help us tackle trade barriers where they arise. And as I say, those are either tariff barriers or their regulatory barriers. You don't need a trade agreement to solve those things. Trade agreements can be helpful. But often these, these issues can be solved outside trade agreements, sometimes on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. But again, some in-market knowledge and expertise of how that's done uh, is really important. And as we look ahead to Brexit and beyond, one of the things that you know, will be important to us as an industry, uh, where normally we have gone to EU delegation offices with these sorts of issues, is to know where we go uh, where we go into the future. And some of that is also for us around intellectual property. As you know, Scotch whisky is a geographical indication. There are other geographical indications uh, in the Scottish food and drink industry. And they're important to the value of each of those products as you export them. They're the things that stop those things becoming generic. And so again, where those issues arise, some in-market support is useful. I could just expand on in market support could also be in not necessarily government but also through the overseas business network which is the British Chambers of Commerce um, kind of overseas network of British Chambers of Commerce in various um, markets around the world of which the CBBC is also included for the, it's the designated one for, for China so um, especially in, in light of the fact that you know, UK and Scottish government don't have a, a huge presence in every market around the world. I think we do need to draw upon the the the, the support networks that are, are out there for providing exactly the kind of support that Karen alluded to. Right, um, Gillian Martin and Tom Arthur wanted to come in with supplementaries. So first of all, Gillian. Yeah, Martin. I just want to come back to something that, that uh, Neil uh, Francis was saying around the, the celebrating. Success. I and mean, how important is it that civic society, particularly the media, look positively on trade missions abroad? I'm thinking of things like Tartan Week in New York. We just had that last week. The first minister's visits to, to, to China uh, last week as well. I mean, it's a lot of the press around that seems to be quite kind of negative, kind of uh, you know, not 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 looking at these things as, as being positive experiences and, and looking for for negativity in them. And that has does that have an impact on um, as companies who actually might be thinking of exporting and that, that general kind of psyche around this? Do you think that's important that we have more positive? Uh, approach to, to those sort of trade missions and initiatives? Yes, I, I absolutely. I, I think, you know, <coughs> the media has and will continue to have an influence uh, on uh, society as a whole, but also on, on, on companies. Uh, and I think uh, that kind of mood music is really, really, really important. The other thing I would add is, obviously, in terms of uh, and it's been alluded to by a number of my colleagues already, uh, that our kind of international uh, perspective is broader than simply trade and investment. Trade and investment is a very tangible uh, outcome, but it's important that in all aspects of uh, Scotland life, whether it be civic, 
uh, uh, community uh, uh, or, or governmental. There has to be an international mindset and building that right through the fabric of our society is really, really important because you know people might get their first experience through through one avenue, but then be much more open when they end up working with a company to actually think about in international. You know, and we've also you know just seen the Commonwealth Games again, another uh, kind of platform for Scotland. You know, you know being uh, seen as an outward progressive internationally minded country which I think is really really important yeah I don't know if anyone else get any thoughts on that at all because it's a bit of international reputation isn't it do you think it has an impact I mean particularly James Brodie obviously working in China do you think it has an impact on the way that Chinese um, traders will look at Scotland if we have this kind of m mood music that's surrounding our uh, interaction with China that's, that's, that's negative? Uh, I, I mean, I do think, you know, positive um, press on, on such missions would be, would be much appreciated. Um, although I would, I'm not too concerned that the negative press that you sometimes see in, in Scotland will have much of an impact in China, per se, you know, itself. I don't think um, it's very difficult to make a a media splash in, in China mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think domestic Scottish um, press is, is making much of a splash. In, uh, I wish it, it was making a, more of a splash. But it might have a, a negative impact with someone who actually might rule out actually going out to... For the Scottish yes, companies yes, here, I mean, you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're quite right and I think um, for, for those, those companies I think it probably does have an impact, yeah. I, do, I don't think on the other side of the... You know. Yeah, it was the other side I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, yes. no, fair, fair But point. I think it, it builds to Karen's point about trade promotion. Uh, the more uh, uh, those markets, those countries that we want to engage internationally with have a broad understanding of what Scotland stands for, right across a, a whole gamut, whether you know it's to come here to visit as a tourist, whether it's to come here to study at our academic institutes, form academic partnerships, or to trade or invest. The more they understand what we stand for, then the easier it will be for companies to access those markets for their specific products or services. That's that's clear, and I think what we saw last week with Scotland is now is a bringing together all our interests internationally in one cohesive approach to build our international reputation, and I think that is absolutely critical. Right, we'll move on to Tom Arthur's follow-up. I think uh, Jelaine's question mostly covered it. I'd probably say that beyond civic society, there's a responsibility for politicians. Um, I just wondered if the panel would agree with me that decrying the First Minister's visit to the United States last year um, as not getting on with the day job and she should be back here isn't very helpful. It sends out the wrong mood music and indeed opposition politicians decrying the use of the Scotland is Now campaign, for example, and saying that's a waste of money. Um, do you think it's important for politicians as well to be sending out the right messages as well as wider civic society and the media? You can just say yes. <laughs> Does anyone wish to comment on that without taking a political position? I'm not, I'm not asking for a political position, <laughs> a position to be taken. I'm simply pointing out there seems to be a bit of tall poppy syndrome that goes well, on in this country. Getting myself fired. <laughs> uh, I think it's really important that uh, across the, the whole of Scotland, Scotland society, everyone in a leadership position exercises leadership and what we uh, I think uh, have agreed upon uh, having a very clear way of making a, a, a very clear uh, method of making our way internationally is incredibly important uh, to our future so so that would be really important was that a politician's answer to you? <laughs> Fantastic answer. We have, we have another taker here, Karen Betts. Scotland has so much to be proud of on the international stage. And, and I think sometimes we can get sucked into, uh, you know, in our own media, a, a negative view of all sorts of things. But I think that 
I'm not sure that, that negative press puts companies off, but I think it goes back to the mindset issue about, about Scotland's role in the world and part of that is trade and exporting. And I think that we have so much that is positive to contribute across the board and I think uh, fostering somehow that sense of nurturing, that sense of positivity is very important. Thank you. We'll come on to Colin Beattie now. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask you just a, a very simple question. What more does the Scottish Government need to do to support internationalisation? Is what we're doing enough? Is it a case of doing more of the same? Or do we need to do something totally different? So I'll start with this one. Um, So there are, there are lots of fantastic routes for Scottish companies to um, exploit the opportunities in export. Um, there are, you know, been mentioned, uh, I think, you know, from <clears throat> the other side of the desk when I was uh, part of industry and, a, and, and leading a business, um, the support that we got from Scottish Enterprise, from SDI, from Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, Chambers of Commerce, excellent, really good. And if you are minded and therefore the door has been opened on that this is a route to go and, and can be a successful one. Um, it's a great experience. Uh, I can say from my own personal experience at a, a time when we were launching a new product um, in Asia pr principally and SDI opened doors for us uh, that we can open on our own and I'm not just saying that because Neil's sitting uh, two spaces to the right. The, the challenge and the opportunity I think comes from it felt to me for a while that when I met other companies, um, they would reflect that that's fine for you. So the company I was with at that time, Polaroid, account managed by Scottish Enterprise, um, and we were well looked after. And I would meet other companies who would say it feels harder to get access to those uh, to those support mechanisms. Not impossible, but it's harder. Um, and I wonder whether that's the opportunity. You know, obviously we've. Steve Dunlop's coming in at post. Um, that'll be a chance for you know new leadership to to look and see where the opportunities are for that. Um, it felt to me in that situation that when the regional legs were taken away, certainly it felt like there was a gap. Um, uh, so much that uh, um, sort of more local regional support for enterprise um, fell into local authorities. Um, I would say even they wouldn't be offended if I said that they're not absolutely best place to think in terms of internationalisation, whereas Scottish Enterprise, SDI, and the others I mentioned are. Um, uh, you know, and I think w with that, and you know, and maybe in light of the, um, the acknowledgement of uh, a solution for South of Scotland in terms of enterprise, that that provides maybe a, a shift which is, okay, how do we get the best balance on this? Where we have economy of scale, but we have the right solution for either the right region or the or it's local enough, um, so that that support, and it is good support, but make sure that it's, it's as open to all as possible. I think that becomes the, the challenge. And I think there's an opportunity to do that because we have a new chief executive coming in um, in, in Scottish Enterprise. Anyone else want to comment on that? I can come in here. Um, something that I probably should have caveated my, my comments at the beginning with is that for Scottish farmers and growers and crofters, the biggest, our biggest market is our home market. So 70% of our produce um, goes probably no further than the boundaries of the M25, to be quite honest. Um, and so it's, it's a small amount of what we produce that is um, exported internationally. But what we do export, we do extremely well. Um, so it's important that we continue to produce for the home market and have things in place there to, to support our farmers. And it's very clear that UK consumers have a very clear preference towards very high standards, provenance and origin. And it's on those principles that we also sell abroad. So I think, uh, I'm sorry to keep going back to the, the Brexit issue, but it really is the, the number one um, thing that is occupying our and our members' minds at the moment. But it's hugely important, I suppose, that our home producers are supported by Scottish Government to continue to produce to those high standards, then it's recognised that does come at a cost. And I think Scottish Government does actually get that. But when it's 
perhaps UK negotiators in the room negotiating new trade deals. What we must um, not forget is the importance of having very high equivalent standards and protecting things such as the protected geographical indications, which um, Karen mentioned, um, for things like Scotch beef. It's hugely important. And if we let them slip away, then that could be quite devastating for our agricultural industry. So I'm not saying the Scottish Government could do more. What I'm saying is we, we want to work very closely with the Scottish Government over the coming weeks, uh, months and years, um, as we find ourselves at a bit of a crossroads in order to make sure they're they really are the top priorities. Can I just add a, a perspective? So we've looked at a number of other countries to see what they do in terms of supporting their companies to internationalise, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, uh, Ireland and other European countries. No one is really doing anything uniquely different from what we are doing. Uh, what you see is uh, differences in scale and investment, principally. So it's, it's how much people are investing. And, you know, more commentators look to Ireland and the scale of investment they make in terms of supporting their trade and their inward investment is considerable, given uh, the size of their country. So it's really scale I think James Brody wanted to come in as well. Didn't he? Yeah, I think um, largely speaking, I think most of the, the tools and most of the initiatives and programmes are, are probably there, um, but I think there could still be more work done in aligning those those programmes more um, than currently is the case. So for, for the end user company who actually just wants support, just being signposted and um, making sure that, you know, if a government is funding different initiatives that they're forcing them through that funding mechanism to, to work together rather than in, in duplication. And it's I know that there's also very many initiatives aimed at trying to bring those things together. It's not it's not easy, but um, I think the more work that can be done in that regard, the better. So present, you feel it's a little bit cluttered? Can be. Just, just still on this question of uh, government uh, support, do you think that the government's international uh, internationalisation strategy is well focused, well targeted? <laughs> maybe, maybe I should ask if you know what the government's <laughs> internationalisation strategy is. So I, I'll give that a go. So I think uh, it's it's a strategy, so it sets out the ambition and the uh, broad uh, areas that need to be tackled. I think it's good in so much that it recognises that in order to be successful, it's not simply what you do to achieve the uh, end outcome. So uh, I think what's really positive about about the strategy, it it puts uh, an ask on uh, our infrastructure, whether that be our physical infrastructure, our digital in infrastructure. Uh, <coughs> it puts an ask on our education sector and some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, so uh, I think you, you you know if if I think of international, it's kind of almost at the end of, of a journey and there's lots of building blocks that you have to put into place that you won't directly see them generating the outcome today or tomorrow but fundamentally they are critical in building a sustainable international kind of uh, performance. Is the, is the focus actually on the right sectors? Paul Sheeran mentioned about uh, some, some companies had a bit of difficulty accessing support. Is the government strategy actually targeted on the right sectors? Are we developing the right sectors? Well, you would be asking the wrong person if you asked me because, you know, manufacturing and engineering is all, you know, I am I, about. And uh, so I would say more please, more please. But I suspect everybody sitting to the right of me uh, would say exactly the same thing. I think the better way to answer it is, is... Uh, you know, you asked the question, Colin, about have we got the right strategy? The strategy 
to me and what boils down to so the member companies I speak to is essentially export is good and putting the effort and energy into that to improve and increase that is where we want to support and that's the bit that I've taken away from that and I think that's where companies in terms of accessing those 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 services I think the services are good um, so yeah one of the themes that I've got is, is it'd be great to make sure that we enable that those that are interested and those that have got ambition find an easy route to those to those services. And just to add to that, Colin, I think we, you know, we've talked before at the committee, we've got two challenges in terms of our export performances. The total value that we generate from international trade and it's the number of companies who actually uh, drive that value. And as we know, we've got too few companies accounting for too much of that trade and we have uh, too few total exporters. So, you know, we do need to tackle both those things, uh, and we do need to, uh, so from my perspective, almost every company will have an international opportunity in some market. Uh, and it's important we find appropriate mechanisms to support that. And what we do know is the uh, proliferation of online platforms globally are making it much easier for very small companies in very niche, uh, with niche products going for niche markets or even big markets, make that much more viable. But we also have to look at some of the sectors that are actually really driving performance. And we've talked a lot about food and drink, uh, and we could talk about energy in terms of oil and gas performance, uh, technology and engineering. Those, those are, are some of our key sectors that will continue to drive that total value performance and we need to continue to support them as well. Thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Uh, we've heard this morning there's no lack of ambition in terms of getting companies to export, etc. So um, what I would like to know is what type of support is out there uh, to encourage companies to export or to examine the possibilities of exporting? James Brody. To take one very tangible service that mm. we've, we've got on offer um, and also to come back to uh, earlier committee members' question about uh, success stories and case studies, mm. um, I could look at uh, Devro, uh, who mm. manufacture sausage casings. Mm. Um, they use the service of ours called uh, Launchpad, uh, which is a business incubation model whereby um, any UK company can use one of our offices in China as a base for an employee who mm. would be employed under uh, CBBC's uh, payroll, but could work full-time for a, a UK company. So it basically offers a, a bridge mechanism whereby they don't open themselves up to the liabilities that they might do if they open up their own legal entity and if they're not quite sure about exactly what that legal entity should look like or if the market's actually for them but it gives them a 12-month period in which they can really deeply assess that that market um, and decide how to develop their business further so Devro did that um, several years ago they were they ended up being in Launchpad for three years um, ended up setting up their own um, office manufacturing um, hub. They've now uh, employing over 200 um, staff in, in, in China have a very, I think it's the most efficient of their seven worldwide plants is, is now based in China. So that, that would be one service that, that, that's there just to, to point to a very tangible one and I know that that exists in, in other markets where some of the market barriers are perhaps more significant than than in, in other places so so you kind of sometimes need that um, buffer zone that a lot of companies are still whilst they might be ambitious they're not 100% convinced by the, the the merits of a market or whether the market's there for them um, so they need that kind of hand holding period where they're in a, a more protected environment uh, before they take the, the next the next step so I think if you can offer those kind of services that can, can de-risk um, the, the opportunity to some extent um, it's very well um, received by, by industry we've, yeah, we've had a lot of success in that. Anybody else? 
just a, a very small example from our sector, and um, it's not specifically geared towards putting members in touch to directly export or anything like that, but we have something um, called the, Scot the Scottish Rural Leadership Programme, um, which um, which runs every every year, and there are some fantastic success stories of businesses who have um, gone on to that, and it's, it's basically about uh, giving your own, the, getting your own business acumen in place to sort of grow your own confidence and grow your business in whichever way you might want to. So, one small example off the top of my head that I can think of is um, Grampian Growers, um, who who grow daffodils um, up north, and they are now the, the biggest exporter of daffodil bulbs in the UK. And they took part in the Scottish Rural Leadership Programme and said that it was very helpful for them in putting them in touch with the right people and allowing them to have a bit more ambition for their business. So, small example, but there's lots of these schemes that, you know, if linked together, um, yeah. are very supportive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Add one other thing into that, because I think it's a good question. And I come back to that theme of it's kind of cross pollination. So there are lots of support mechanisms, or number that, that that go, but they're dependent on connection. So I had one last week where a company based in uh, the Netherlands uh, got in touch through uh, Scottish Engineering because they're interested in uh, manufacturing capacity or capability in Scotland. So we connect them to the right thing. So that cross pollination thing works. I think the bigger question or that other one is, is well, what can you do that kind of doesn't depend on those one-to-one -one connections or, you know, Scottish manufacturing advisory service going into a company and going, oh, you do that? Well, do you know that there are companies out there in Europe who are interested in that? You should look at that. So it's, it's almost by chance. And one of the things I came across this week earlier was I met somebody, another person who'd been through the Saltire Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that in terms of how do you seed a kind of international approach that's a super successful programme. There are others like it. The one I heard of was the Young Chamber um, organisation, the Young Chamber of Commerce kind of organisation. So there are lots of, of those, but if you want to do think about that, how do you enable at a generational level things like Salter Foundation and those other programmes are excellent at that. And what you're doing is you're setting people out who will go and in our careers now we'll go from company to company yeah. but you'll be taking that mindset and thought yeah. with you and asking the questions. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So is there is there any one issue whether it's engineering or farming that needs to be addressed that would encourage or assist companies to export? Is there any one issue that needs to be addressed, burn, one burning issue in each of your sectors? So I think uh, skills availability is and remains you know, concern, and so there's been a good bit of discussion in our groups recently. You know, we are in a situation of of relatively low unemployment. Um, there is definitely a stretch and squeeze on those skills. Um, you know, if I had a magic wand for our industry, you know, one of the things that after Brexit is the most universally unliked topic in my conversations. It's apprenticeship levy seems to be having the opposite effect to what it intended to do. Um, I don't think that's even just a, 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 a feedback that's true in Scotland. I think it, you know, in our contacts with the Engineering Employer Federation, it, it's the same. Uh, and they've reported a drop year on year in the number of apprenticeships as, as a result. Um, so if we all agree that export is good, if we agree that making things and engineering things as part of that overall picture mm -hmm. is good, um, and we agree that we have an ageing workforce and we want to encourage more uh, people to be in that thread, then look for barriers. And I'm sorry, but right now, apprenticeship levy is a barrier. Companies are actively talking about whether they want to carry on with apprenticeship programmes because of the burden that that, that places on them. Mm -hmm. So um, there's an ask. Thank you. Yeah, I would. Um, the point on skills filters through to our to our sector um, very clearly as well. Um, it's perhaps an uncomfortable fact for us, and it's a figure that we bandy around. It won't be statistically accurate, but we say that you know, the um, eighty percent think that they're in the top twenty percent, um, and it, and it's true. And I think particularly post Brexit, we need to get a lot better at farming <coughs> more productively, and not mistaking that for just being more productive. It's actually about. Um, you know, producing what we produce, but doing it a lot better and putting a lot less into it, which then in turn will have much better implications for the environment and, and costs and, and downstream things as well. But um, we do have an issue with skills. Um, 
you know, farming and food technology um, are not particularly hot topics within the school curriculum, and that's something which, which we are looking to address and think that as an industry we need to take the lead. It's not about finger-pointing to education providers. I think we need to bring everybody together. And we're very much at the start of that process at the current time. Um, but looking ahead, we need to try and do a lot more to cultivate young people to actually think about farming um, as a viable career moving forward. And if not farming, then all the other downstream industries that are that kind of feed into agriculture more generally, because um, there are big opportunities, but we need people to fill these roles moving forward. And my, my last point is um, the last meeting of the Economy Committee, we heard from one witness that he believed there wasn't enough use of e-commerce. Um, and, that, you know, I'm just wondering in your own individual sectors, do you feel that there's enough use of the internet to sell abroad uh, or highlight the products that you guys have got available? Uh, and is there enough support coming from government agencies in order to encourage people to make use of e-commerce? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of our members would love to make more of it, but um, purely because of their location and the peripherality, um, broadband services aren't quite there at the current time. So, I think I said earlier on in answer to Julian's question that I, th I think we have to do even more to encourage people to look at the online trading platforms, the Amazons and, and the Alibabas and all of these, and support companies to do that. Uh, we partnered Amazon last summer, I think it was, in their academy uh, in Edinburgh. That is running again, I think, today in, in uh, Glasgow, and I think there are going to be over 500 attend that. Uh, so it's it's definitely a very viable route to market that is low cost for uh, people uh, and especially the the as I said earlier the small uh, company with the very niche product. So yeah, we will continue to to support that. Yeah. Specific to China, obviously, but e-commerce is massive there, and, and accessing the Chinese market is a crucial channel. So it. It, you know, almost all the events that we do, we, we will talk about the e-commerce um, platforms available in China and how to access them. So um, we've got a lot of members that offer services to, to access it through that. So it's, yeah, very, very important for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just wanted to clarify one thing with Paul Sheeran. You talked about a year-on-year -year fall of in apprenticeships. So I believe... Um, Quoting from memory now, uh, there was an article in January uh, that the EF uh, um, reported, I want to think, a 24% fall. I don't know if it was a year on year or if it was quarter on quarter, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I do remember that story was uh, carried by the BBC in, um, in January. But the, the apprenticeship levy, it's not because of that, because that's just it came in from 6 April 2017, so you wouldn't have year on year comparisons for that. I think that that's fair. So, as I say, uh, maybe a, a quarter or a half year. But the the point of the article was that it was worried that there was a correlation between the unpopularity of the apprenticeship levy and the the net outcome of a drop in the number of apprenticeships uh, being taken up. And I can say, you know, from my own evidence that I've you know met companies who've said, you know, the apprenticeship levy is causing us to stop and think about whether we want to have apprentices going forward. Mm, okay. yeah. And of course it's different in Scotland than, than England because they're separate systems. It, it is. Uh, I suppose the, you know, that was my point is that uh, uh, across the board they're both, there's, a, there's dissatisfaction uh, for different reasons on both sides of the border, uh, but I haven't met anybody on mass who has a good thing to say about it. Well, would it not be a good thing to uh, actually set up systems to encourage and support companies in having apprenticeships? Yeah, if, if you think the apprenticeship levy does that compared to what was in place before, because the companies that I certainly have spoken to about it don't feel that's the case. Right, but we, right, we'll, we'll move on to questions from Jackie Bailey. Can I take us back to exports? Uh, um, I think we would all in the room agree that exporting 
is a good thing. Um, and, you know, I hesitate to be negative, given the previous criticism. But, but I do think we need to understand what works and what doesn't work um, in order that we can maximise the opportunities going forward. So, um, 2015, internationalisation became a key part of the government's economic strategy, and we all welcomed it. Um, so I'm keen to know how we've performed against some of those targets. So, for example, one was um, to boost exports by 50% between 2010 and 2017. Did we achieve it? Um, and if not, what was the barrier to us achieving that? So that, that's the first question. I can run through the others because they're in similar vein. So, so that's the first one. The second one is um, one of the studies done by SDI established that you are very good at supporting trade and investment amongst existing companies. So the example Paul gave of Polaroid is you know, an absolute case in point. You've got somebody there who is account managed, you know, they get all the support that's necessary. I wonder, given that SMEs make up the bulk of the Scottish economy, how successful we've been at actually encouraging them um, to get involved. Because when I look at SE's internationalization targets, we actually haven't really been wholly meeting them. So I'm looking for a very honest assessment of where we've been in order to then develop some questioning about where we should go. And I'll look at Neil first. Thank you, Jackie. That's very <coughs> welcome. So uh, clearly the uh, original 50% uh, increase in the value of uh, international trade has not been met. Uh, I, ha I hesitate to give you a single reason why that's the case. Uh, I think what's important is it did set an ambition, and an ambition that we should be working towards. And we should also use it as a means of holding ourselves to account in terms of understanding uh, what has worked uh, and what could work better. Uh, so that would be my answer to that one. In terms of uh, the companies supported, I think I said at the uh, outset that, uh, or earlier, we've got two things to tackle, the total value and the total number of companies. And in, when that strategy was uh, originally launched, there wasn't the emphasis put on encouraging companies to export for the first time. We've now uh, changed that and are putting a lot uh, of effort into that. I think, uh, between, I mean, in recent years, the, the total number of companies from an SDI perspective we've been supporting with their international trade ambitions has grown from 1,300 to 2,300. So fairly significant. And in terms of the number of companies we've been supporting, to trade internationally for the first time. Well, in last year, 1617, we supported almost 1,600 companies uh, to do that for the first time. So I think uh, my honest assessment would be we are in the right areas. We are engaging strongly with uh, companies and supporting them uh, where we can. Uh, what hasn't necessarily happened is the outcomes, the scale of the outcomes, uh, not only from the companies we work with, but from the economy as a whole in terms of our international performance. And I won't rehearse now, but I was here last month or the month before where we talked specifically about the valuation evidence in terms of both our inward investment and our trade performance. Is is that enough? Do it, I get let off for that? Well, maybe, right? <laughs> maybe. Let, let, let me just pursue one point, because you, you, you gave us some very impressive numbers. I'm kind of wondering, are these companies the ones you've provided help to? Yeah. Are they actually exporting now? So, so the number I said when we grew from 1,300 to 2,300, mm. those are really existing exporters, Okay. right? The other number I gave you, which is around the 100, 1,600, are the support to new exporters, so companies we're trying to get to export for the first time. Okay. Are all the 1,600 no. now exporting? No. no. So, so actually, a, a truer figure wouldn't be an input figure. 
which is the support you give them, but the outcome figure of how many are actually now trading. And it would be enormously helpful if you don't have them to hand, if you could certainly provide them, because I think that gives us a truer picture of what's out there so we understand we, what, what the challenge I'll, is. I'll certainly uh, do that for the last three years. Okay. And what I would say is uh, getting companies to trade internationally for the first time is one of the hardest things mm -hmm. we are trying to do. There's also timing issues. You know, you work with a company and it might be three years before they secure their first international contract. So there's a lag, but you'll appreciate that. No, I do appreciate that. I think it's just to get a, a better yeah, picture. Of course. And I'll I, do I, that. I wonder from the people that consume the, the, the services on offer, um, given the current strategy, what do you think? I know you've replied to, to Colin in similar terms, but, but how would you change the targets on the strategy? Because the targets determine where the resource goes and determines the kind of help you get as a priority from the government. First go. Um, so I, I, I suppose I, I wouldn't change the target. I think the target's good to have a, a, a stretched uh, ambition. Uh, and we've talked about ambition a few times already today. Um, you know, Clearly, as Neil's uh, you know, uh, alluded to in terms of meet, meeting that target, that's not happened. But what I would give is evidence where there's been um, a positive outcome from the setting a good target and setting a decent ambition. Uh, so I was up in Aberdeen two weeks ago uh, visiting member companies who, um, you know, in the oil and gas and, and from Aberdeen down through Fife and Dundee. Um, and what I did see was uh, a little bit that Neil's uh, reflected companies that uh, have been doing many things to survive the downturn. Uh, they've done so by becoming more efficient, uh, they've done so by tightening their belt, but they've also done so by diversifying um, and opening up either new sectors, including um, export. Um, and those that are starting to be successful in export, it's small green shoots, but um, I do think that you can point from that to the ambition to this is, you know, export is good, making things and selling them is good, um, and there's a bit of patience. So um, I get your point about the, the, the target, and I think, you know, that there's a, that's, a, from my point of view, member companies don't matter, set the bar high, um, export is good, making things and selling things is good. Um, that's the only message we really care about. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I agree with, um, with Paul in that regard in terms of um, setting a bar high is it can only be a good thing um, to, to motivate all of us to support as much as we can the new exporters. I think the target on new exporters is also something that we see reflected at a UK level um, through our um, uh, funding from the Department for International Trade. Um, we also have, in the last couple of years, been pushed very heavily towards supporting companies that have not exported to China before. So not they might be exporters, but not exporting to China. So um, I'm also quite familiar with that lag time that, that Neil referred to in terms of we might give a good amount of support in year one, and it's not until year three that they pick up the phone and say, by the way, did you know that we've just secured a contract? Um, and it might well all go back to that year one support so um, it can be a, a challenge to get those outcomes in the you know very near term um, but I think it's a yeah honourable ambition to, to encourage more exporters I think time and time again if you look at export statistics from Scotland the sample size is just too small to make any very firm conclusions when you see it rise and fall you know drawing conclusions on a sample base that small is is uh, and and with so few kind of very large exporters accounting for um some of the you know in absolute terms the biggest volumes but actually see in in uh qualitative terms there's actually more companies perhaps um exporting but they might just be small smes so it still doesn't knock away the fact that the downturn in the oil prices has affected their overall volume of again i can only really talk to the Scotland China statistics but uh, that was certainly the case with the with the 40 percent increase in in um, export to to China last year I think the biggest 
um, chunk of that was oil products, oil uh, and, and petroleum products, um, and I think that can largely be put down to you know an upturn in the oil price um, on the positive side. Uh, so. Yeah, the more we can do to encourage more companies to export for the first time, the, the better. Okay. Claire, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, no. yeah. I agree with all that's been said. I think uh, ambition is good. Um, whenever agriculture in Scotland is never going to compete on a sort of stack it high and sell it low, massive commodity market. But what we do do, we do very well. Um, and in terms of food and drink exports, we've, we have smashed through targets. Um, I don't have them in front of me, but I will certainly... The targets that were set in 2007 we reached um, in 2010 I believe um, and now we have much bigger um, targets to do more so um, it's very positive. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Andy Whiteman had some questions about internationalisation of exports or yeah. that direction. Yeah just a couple of specific questions for Neil Francis following the evaluation. I mean the evaluation raised a number of um, questions and rec made some recommendations one of which was to um, better integrate the work of SGI with Scottish Enterprise and the other um, high, etc. Uh, how significant do you think that is, and, and will the new strategic board assist in that process? So I, I, I think it's a great point, and, and it's a recognition that in order to be successful in, internationally, a company needs to do a number of different things. Sometimes they need to innovate their product, sometimes they need to enhance their leadership skills. So that integration of business support is a, a really critical thing. And of course, it's something that we've been doing for a number of years. And we, I think what the report was emphasizing was that you need to carry on doing that. Uh, I think as colleagues have said today, uh, there are other aspects of international support that are provided by sister agencies uh, uh, and partners and it is important that we do all we can to integrate those into a cohesive set of services available to the customer so it makes it m easier. We mustn't put another barrier in the, in, in the way. So I think the sense that the strategic board uh, requires the agencies to collaborate more strongly will be a very positive thing for us. And just another question about collaboration and integration. Is the relationship between SDI and the wider enterprise network and the Department of Trade in the UK government? Um, how is that relationship working? It's a critical relationship, obviously, with Brexit. So so I, I think it's, 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 it is a very critical relationship. I think what you have now is in terms of the Department of International Trade, it has a much broader remit than its predecessor, which was UKTI. So our principal relationship uh, as SDI with uh, DIT is on the operational delivery, uh, uh, and that's very strong. Uh, there are some differences market by market uh, uh, of how we work, and in some markets we work extremely well. In other markets, there are uh, room for improvement. And that's not me being critical of either DIT or ourselves. I'm just stating the fact that we, we could do more to be uh, 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 more collaborative in certain markets. But in general, it's a very positive relationship. At the end of the day, we're trying to achieve the same outcomes, which is support companies to uh, enhance and increase their international trade. The other aspect that's really important with DIT now is, is the whole trade policy. Uh, and of course, that's uh, not only in relation to uh, the outcome that would be when we exit the EU, but also what we're doing in terms of trade policy with the rest of the world. That is, from a Scotland point of view, being led by colleagues in the Scottish Government. Okay. Thank you. And, and I think one last question from John Mason about environmental impact. Uh, th thanks, Convener. Um, clearly, as we move things around the world, uh, there could be a, an environmental impact. You know, I suppose if all the Russians drank all the vodka and we drank all the whiskey, then we wouldn't need all the ships and lorries to move between them. Uh, do you take environment on board when you're looking at trade? How can we mitigate against some of these environmental issues? Are these issues for you? So, uh, I think actually, and that's but you're absolutely right. Moving things around the world has got an environmental impact, and, and there's you know I, I can't can't step away from that. 
I think from an environmental impact, um, <coughs> I actually think from an engineering manufacturing point of view, um, the circular economy is a massive opportunity for, for Scotland. Um, I think it's a massive opportunity because it's something that comes with a carrot and a stick. The stick being the environmental impact. If we don't do something about it, then things will not carry on as they are. But the, the carrot comes is that for many businesses uh, that are manufacturing new OEM equipment, um, the margins and therefore the sustainability of the company for um, low margin uh, new equipment business is difficult. Um, those companies that have been uh, getting more actively involved in refurbishment, repair, uh, or new manufacturer using more uh, you know, techniques that are aligned to circular economy kind of outcomes are seeing the benefits in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, their overall sustainability because the margins are better. I mean, many companies will say, and you know, certainly the companies I was involved with, it was true. Um, we made, we paid our bills from our new equipment manufacturer, and we made our profitability on our aftermarket sales and service. Um, the margins on refurbished, remanufactured equipment are more akin to aftermarket sales and service, and so there's the carrot. Um, that might come at a slight shrinkage in terms of revenue, uh, but it is a more sustainable business, you know, overall. Um, now, and if I, I go back to uh, a, an example I gave earlier, uh, and forgive me, I can't help the engineer in me, but I saw something that really caught my eye, which was one of those companies I talked about that's selling, um, um, they were manufacturing casings for satellites, uh, selling in Italy. And the space industry, like the um, aerospace industry, uh, one of the, the key metrics which they use is the thing called the buy-to-fly ratio. So buy to fly ratio is, at its essence, talks to the circular economy. The buy to fly ratio being, if I need to make a satellite casing out of Inconel, and I need to buy 200 kilograms a billet of that, and then I gouge out 180 gram, uh, kilograms from the middle to, to make the casing overall, then my buy to fly ratio is not so good. If I come up with a way of manufacturing that that builds up the material layer on layer, and comes up with the same structurally sound component, um, then I win the competitive advantage. And so, you know, it's an example where, you know, the idea of manufacturing things in a different way, which has a much, much less environmental impact, actually can lead to competitiveness and better sustainability. Um, we'll come on. Uh, there's perhaps one final question, which may uh, also touch on what's just been said by Paul Sheehan from Gillian Martin about uh, best international practice. Yeah, um, actually, I'm going to ask about Brexit. Um, and But what you've just been saying, Paul, has actually led on to... We obviously have had a historical reputation as a country of uh, invention, innovation, manufacturing. But international pro um, intellectual property is key to that, and it will be post Brexit in particular, given that IP is something that is actually protected and, and um, I suppose administrated by the EU. Now we've got um, the International Trade Minister in front of us on Thursday and I just really want to give you the opportunity with Claire Slipper and Paul Sheeran to ask, what, what would you like to ask him about protection of the geographical indicators, the, the trademarks and intellectual property that your industries have as an ask in terms of clarity now, given that it hasn't really been discussed in any of the transitional papers? Take that just very, very quickly. Um, I think our question would be, are the GIs important to them and are they going to be protected? Because we've seen in um, previous trade deals, most recently the, the CETA deal with Canada, um, the protected geographical indications were left out, which left certain products uh, that we have here in Scotland, like Scotch beef, um, quite exposed and having done some investigation into why that was it, it, it appeared that somebody within DIT had just purely forgotten to include them on the schedule so that's a major area of emphasis for us perhaps that isn't shared elsewhere with our colleagues in the rest of the UK but um, I suppose I'd be very interested to hear from directly from um, the Minister um, whether or not these are valuable 
to them. And that's that's key to, to Scottish farming and food and drink production generally as we've heard today. In terms yes. of the intellectual property for things like engineering, innovation, manufacturing, the intellectual property is key to that too. Yeah, so once again, the, the concern there is, I mean, there are other ways to protect your intellectual property, um, regard, you know, depending on what that outcome looks like. The concern is is that it takes a lot more effort, takes a lot more uh, spend um, and resource and time and effort than it does just now. And yeah, that is a concern um, for, those, uh, for those companies that are exporting. Do you think the UK is <coughs> ready for that? Do you think we've got the I have no idea. Place? I have no idea. Um, it's an area of, uh, of detail that I, I don't know. Right, well, I will ask then what is now the final question, uh, and that is, um, are there any specific examples in, in the international field of uh, public support for internationalisation that we in Scotland could learn from? Are any of you aware of, or do you have any specific country or example that comes to mind? An example that I would draw from, and it's, it's not particularly around public support, but... Um, I've got a colleague who's just come back from a study trip to New Zealand to look at the livestock industry over there and how they work with their government um, to, to export. And um, it's, it's a very international outlook that they have in terms of the export of lamb in particular in New Zealand. They export to over 100, 100 countries. And um, the point that my colleague made when he came back was that he was absolutely blown away by the amount of linkage between industry, as in the, the primary producer at one end, with the processor, then with the government, and they were all very much single-minded on what their aims and ambitions were, and it was to export, export, export. And as I've said in the course of the session, um, our biggest market is the home market. We're not going to purely always be focused on an export market, but the lesson that he learned was about that real integration from government right down to the primary producer on the ground. They were all very much aligned on what the priorities were, which I think we could perhaps do a bit more of in this country. Right. Anyone else? And I, uh, perhaps just, just to add to that New Zealand example, uh, we, we talked a little about the importance of developing uh, an international narrative and a, and a brand position and reputation. You know, again, New Zealand has done that successfully uh, over a number of years. And the ability to align all aspects of their society uh, to a common ends in terms of the way they project themselves in internationally is, is, is something that's worthy uh, of, of, of looking at. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, Paul Sheeran, did yeah. you want to give yeah. an example? I'm just going to give another example. And I suppose it's kind of coming from the idea of what can we do, you know, so what do we, we actually do? So my most recent example of that, the, the country that I was most uh, heavily involved in, uh, in working in uh, was in Italy. Um, and the thing that struck me in Italy was I didn't see any, you know, there are a lot, said before, a lot to be proud about what, you know, Scottish manufacturing and, and export, you know, there's a lot of good news stories. And I certainly didn't see something where I thought, oh, wow, you know, Italy is doing, you know, engineering manufacturing much better than Scotland, in some cases quite the reverse. But coming back to that point earlier about who is you know, flying the flag, who is promoting uh, uh, that for Scotland, and whether, as Tom's point, uh, comments about, you know, sort of negative comments uh, hurt it. If you look at the press in Italy, you look at the big dailies, you will see a manufacturing and export story on the front page every single day. You will see their politicians, their business leaders leading by example in that respect. And I think the point I think from that I've taken from today is is that it's all of our responsibility is by lead by example. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it struck me that I would come home and look at our daily, you know, quality newspapers and at best would be on the back page. Um, I go back to Italy the following week and every day that I saw something about engineering and manufacturing. So I think that's it's in all our benefit uh, to raise that profile and, and try and make sure that we're sort of leading from the front in terms of putting exporting is good, making things is good uh, on the front page. Right, well, thank you very much. I think that's a good point at which to uh, finish the session. So thank you to all of our guests for coming in today, and I'll now suspend this meeting and we'll move into private session. Thank you.